My parents did not give me enough money for me to be able to buy expensive things. I thought of a big bowl of old Chinese porcelain, which had been left to me by Aunt Leonie, and of which Mamma prophesied daily that Françoise would come running to her with an, Oh, it's all come to pieces, and that that would be the end of it. Would it not be wiser, in that case, to part with it? to sell it so as to be able to give Gilbert all the pleasure I could. I felt sure that I could easily get a thousand francs for it. I had it tied up in paper, I had grown so used to it that I had ceased altogether to notice it. Parting with it had at least the advantage of making me realise what it was like. I took it with me as I started for the swans, and giving the driver their address, told him to go by the Champs-Élysées, at one end of which was the shop of a big dealer in Oriental things, who knew my father. Quickly to my surprise, he offered me there and then not one thousand, but ten thousand francs for the bowl. I took the notes with rapture. Every day for a whole year I could smother Gilbert in roses and lilac. When I left the shop and got into my cab again, the driver, naturally enough since the swans lived out by the bois, instead of taking the ordinary way, began to drive me along the Avenue des Champs-Élysées. He had just passed the end of the Rue de Berry, when in the failing light I thought I saw, close to the Swan's house, but going in the other direction, going away from it, Gilbert, who was walking slowly, though with a firm step, by the side of a young man with whom she was conversing, but whose face I could not distinguish. I stood up in the cab, meaning to tell the driver to stop, then hesitated. The strolling couple were already some way away, and the parallel lines which their leisurely progress was quietly drawing were on the verge of disappearing in the Elysian gloom. A moment later, I had reached Gilbert's door. I was received by Madame Swann. Oh, she will be sorry was my greeting. I can't think why she isn't in. She came home just now from a lesson, complaining of the heat, and said she was going out for a little fresh air with another girl. I fancy I passed her in the Avenue des Champs-Élysées. Oh, I don't think it can have been. Anyhow, don't mention it to her father. He doesn't approve of her going out at this time of night. Must you go? Goodbye. I left her, told my driver to go home the same way but found no trace of the two walking figures. Where had they been? What were they saying to one another in the darkness so confidentially? I returned home, desperately clutching my windfall of ten thousand francs, which would have enabled me to arrange so many pleasant surprises for that Gilbert, whom now I had made up my mind never to see again. No doubt my call at the dealer's had brought me happiness by allowing me to expect that in future, whenever I saw my friend, she would be pleased with me and grateful. But if I had not called there, if my cabman had not taken the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, I should not have seen Gilbert with that young man. Thus a single action may have two contradictory effects and the misfortune that it engenders cancelled the good fortune that it has already brought one. There had befallen me the opposite of what so frequently happens. We desire some pleasure, and the material means of obtaining it are lacking. It is a mistake, La Bruyere tells us, to be in love without an ample fortune. There is nothing for it but to attempt a gradual elimination of our desire for that pleasure. In my case, however, the material means had been forthcoming, but at the same moment, if not by a logical effect, at any rate as a fortuitous consequence of that initial success, my pleasure had been snatched from me. As for that matter, it seems as though it must always be. As a rule, however, not on the same evening on which we have acquired what makes it possible. Usually, we continue to struggle and to hope 
a little longer. <laughs>